Good afternoon, Kent Bain with Nine Business Group. Welcome back to Elevate Your Business Business Spotlight Interview. We have Jason. Jason, welcome to the program. Please introduce yourself, your company. Uh, what makes you different? What sets you apart then from your competition? Thank you, Kent. So Jason Rush, company is JM Rush Enterprises. Um, I own an executive search firm. I would say the thing that probably sets me apart more so than most of the recruiters is leading with empathy. Um, what I mean by that is I've looked for jobs before I've been in that process. Um, it can be very time consuming. Let's be transparent. It can suck at times, right? Um, so having been that through that, every experience I have with candidates, I try to treat it as like, look, I know what you're going through. I try to over communicate. Sometimes you may not even have an update. But if it's a Friday afternoon, you know, just to send a quick email, send a, a quick text. If I have the time, a quick phone call. Hey, can't haven't heard anything yet. Still working on having forgotten about you. I feel it goes a long way. And even though it seems really simple, the communication aspect, I feel like that's an, an art that's been lost, you know, with a lot of recruiters. Well, I think in general, empathy has been lost by many people in society, not just in the last two years, but in the last uh, 10 years as social media become as, you know, much stronger, we get a little bit further and further from communication. Um, and, and there's just, I think in general, as we see gone out to the world to search more of our own personal identity in that journey, we've lost the other people in the process. Um, since you started in business a few years ago now, 10 plus, what is the biggest challenge you've had to overcome? How did you overcome it? What does it look like today? The biggest challenge, I would say, first and foremost, was moving to Canada. Uh, so when I started the business, I'm from Texas originally. Uh, when I started the business in May 2011, we realized very quickly that we did not have the finance, and I'll get into this later on, but we didn't have the financial runway at that time to really survive. And so my father-in-law was gracious enough to, my both my in-laws, uh, allow us the opportunity to move up here for the summer of 2011 and stay in their basement and kind of get things off the ground. Uh, so at the time we had a house in Texas, uh, we're able to rent that out, sold a lot of our belongings down there, moved up here. It was very humbling very quickly. My my desk when I moved up here was my mother uh, my mother-in-law's uh, sewing machine table. And uh, I was working out of their basement, calling on my, you know, my network down in the US. Um, so the first four or five years I was up here, I wasn't a permanent resident, so I couldn't legally work in Canada, right? So by default, I had no choice, but from day one to make it a remote business. And when I initially started JM Rush Enterprises, that wasn't the plan. I had been working in the Dallas-Fort Worth area for eight years. I had built up a good network. The plan was I was going to go out on my own and meet with those same folks I had been working with, work with those same folks. But a couple of things fell through in the very beginning and it quickly was like, okay, this isn't going to work. Like, we had a lot of personal debt at the time and it was just like, we got to, we got to get things going. So that was the biggest challenge I would say at the time, then for, you know, fast forward four to five years later, we didn't realize the tax laws of Canada. I didn't realize that even though every year we were paying our taxes to the IRS, because I was physically sitting in Canada, the income was sourced in Canada. So therefore I should have been paying the CRA first. So we're in, uh, you know, my wife's seven months pregnant with our first son. We're in one of the baby breathing classes or whatever they're called, Lamans, or I don't, I don't know what the class you want to call it, but basically like working on her breathing and stuff. And I'm behind her and like being a support. And I get an email saying that, you know, it's from our account saying they need to talk to us. So I step out and I find out on that call about two months before she's going to give birth with our first son that we're looking at a six figure back tax bill. And, and, and not like high six figures, like just above 100K, but still it's six yeah. figures. And then for them to find all this out, they're going to charge us about 40 to 50 grand on top. So a huge, huge amount of money. Um, and then factor in the fact that I had not actually closed the deal in over a year, hadn't made a dime. It was 2015 and, and early 16 was a really challenging time for us. So all of that kind of you know, kind of worked together, right? Like we were up here, moved up here. That was a challenge. Finally thought we were getting things off the ground and then realized that we didn't realize the tax loss. So um, we overcame that by working with some good accountants who were quite expensive in the beginning, but we still work with them to this day. They're great. Um, you know, I definitely recommend in my situation, a cross-border accountant, right? Um, we uh, really focused on personal debt and paying that down. 
Um, so we looked at things that charge us the most interest first or the highest interest first, I should say, paying those off, um, you know, sold what we could. We had a, our house in Texas, we sold. So, you know, really worked very hard, uh, tried to not focus on the outside noise and the comparisons on all the people posting on Facebook, how great their life is and all this stuff. Um, just tried to live within our means. And we actually paid all that out and got completely out of debt, except for a mortgage by the summer of 2018. So yeah, good for you. Well, in 2015, 2016 was not a good economic cycle, Alberta, either. So that was a whole different uh, gong show. Um, what is the one thing, you know, now that you wish you would have known 10, 15 years ago? Uh, the financial runway is huge. So I it, I could probably write a book on how not to start a business. Um, so when we first went on our own, again, I thought it was going to be an in-person, hey, Kent, let's go for coffee. Let's go for lunch type business. It wasn't. Secondly, I had a couple of deals I thought that were lined up that were going to pay us X amount of dollars for the first 90 days. And that would have been sustainable. Like if you look or if we looked at our personal debt that we had at the time, our bills monthly and all that, we could have lived OK. Unfortunately, it also fell through in about the first three weeks. Um, we've got uh, quite, you know, it's almost sixty five hundred a month we were paying in bills and debt at that time. And I was bringing in nothing. And so I was like, OK. You know, we're going to have to figure this out here. So if I can give any folks advice on how to start a business, I recommend a six to nine month runway. And I, I recommend having clients that are willing, paperwork signed, willing to buy from you before you decide to go out on your own. Uh, great advice, no question. If there was a pirate, a thief in and around your business, what would they be stealing from you? You know, I've wrestled with this a lot. Over the years, I think sense of worth and value. Um, and, you know, I, you and I talked a little bit before the recording started. Like, I don't know what you want to call me, a solopreneur or whatever. Like, I, I feel like I've been pretty successful. I've intentionally not wanted employees. I, I haven't really, I don't know how good I am as a manager anyway. So, like, I've wanted to kind of just do things on my own. And I, I feel like I've, I've certainly hit that plateau at times, right? But I've, I've done quite well as well financially. So, I'm not complaining. But there's certainly an imposter syndrome aspect. You know, I, I see a lot of peers. I see folks that are younger than me that have been doing this not as long as I have that have decided they want to scale companies and they've been quite successful at it. So I think like, you know, especially, you know, working remotely, like, I mean, I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm, I'm, I appreciate the fact that I get to work remote, but it can be lonely at times too. So I think, you know, like kind of comparing yourself to, to others and like you can lose that sense of value in yourself pretty quick. So, you know, for me, I think that, um, you know, time, of course, you know, sometimes procrastinating, but I, I think, yeah, like if, if there's one thing I could think of the most that can be quickly taken, uh, you know, would, would probably be that. Self-worth, confidence. Yeah, I think so. I mean, like, you know, sometimes you're only as good as your next deal is what you hear your last deal or whatever you want to say, but I've, I've gotten to the point where I don't focus on that. That's not a, you know, a big, big aspect of, of how I deem if I'm successful or not anymore. Certainly used to be. Yeah, uh, certainly was when I wasn't closing deals for almost 16 months. Uh, you really start to question a lot of things. So what uh, well, leads into the next question, which is a nice uh, send off. What is your definition of a successful business and has it changed over the years? Was success different for you by definition in 2011? And has it matured into something else now 10, 15 years later? Yeah. So when I first started, I had, so my last name's Rush. When I first started, I had aspirations of Rush being on a big building and like having all these employees and just being, you know, wearing a suit to the office. Like, again, this is when I was still in Texas when I decided I was going to start my business because prior to starting it, I did wear a suit every day and I worked in downtown Dallas and I was very successful working for, for someone else. And so I thought that's what I was going to do with the business. Um, I was humbled extremely quickly. Again, working off a sewing machine in my in-laws' basement, um, not closing a deal for almost 16 months, um, paying over 100 grand in back taxes. You you learn very quickly that that's, or I learned, I should say, very quickly that that's not really what makes someone successful. You know, like when I when I lived in Dallas, I had a fancy car and I all that stuff that, that didn't make me happy. What makes me happy now and where I feel why I feel like I have been somewhat successful, even though maybe to an outsider, I don't have a big business. I don't have people working for me or whatever um, is because I've really tried to focus more on 
family and like, okay, to me, being successful would be having the time anytime I want to be able to go play with, you know, my boys or, you know, to I, I walk my son, my six year old to school every day and pick him up. Um, we, you know, his school's down the street. So, but being able to do that, being able to take, you know, go on holiday when we want, um, you know, having the, the means and the resources to do that. Um, I still don't know that I don't want to scale a business. I, I don't, I don't want the rush on the building and the suit and all that. Like that's not, not me anymore, but I feel like I'm in a good place now mentally to where even though I don't ever feel like I've reached that, that success point, I certainly like, if you would ask me 11 years ago, like, Hey, this is where you're going to be in 11 years. I'm like, really? Like that. But looking back now, I'm like, yeah, I actually do feel like I've succeeded in some areas, still a long way to go. Um, and I, I'll never want to stop trying to get there, but, um, you know, having that time just to, to have the autonomy and kind of that time to be able to spend with family, spend on things I want. Um, I, I think that's, that's kind of what I, what I deem as a successful business now at this point. I'm with you hundred percent. It's probably a lesson I learned. I think year one of coaching, we'd gotten some amazing results for a client. And then, you know, everything from working 70 hours a week back to like 35, mm -hmm. but he went back to work working Sunday mornings. And it was kind of like, why are you going back working Saturday, Sunday mornings? And he, he said, honestly, it's the stuff I want to do. It's the stuff mm -hmm. I enjoy working on. I didn't, I didn't buy a business to be a business owner. That's a nice benefit, but these are the projects. These are the things that I get to put my heart and soul into. So for him, and it's been that way probably now for the rest of my career, I think, and it goes back to one, business is a vehicle. It, it should empower us to have more of what we want in life. And for almost all of my clients, it's, I call it choice. I think you hit the nail around the head. It, it, your business for you, success is choice. Choice of time, choice of money, choice of where you spend your time. So good for you. I think it's fantastic. And it's, and it's a great inspirational story that everybody has a different definition and, and what they want to invest in and what it means for them. So that being said, now you've had a team of one for a number of years. What do you want to be known for? A good dad, good husband. Um, and this isn't business related, I guess. A good person. I mean, I, I'm in the industry of recruiting. I deal with people every day. Um, I, I want, and I feel like I've kind of made a, a bit of a brand for myself where I genuinely like helping people. I, I kind of treat like, like, how can I help this person first instead of how can I make money helping this person first? If that makes any sense, I found the money kind of follows. Sometimes it doesn't, right? But it, it all goes full circle. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'd like to be known as, as someone from a business standpoint who has helped a lot of people, who genuinely enjoys doing that. Um, but you know, personally, good dad, good husband, good person. And yeah, I feel like if I, if I can check those boxes, those three or four boxes, I feel like I've, I've done something right. So uh, no, that's great. Absolutely. So before we wrap up, um, who, first of all, who do you want to find your website? And then how would they, you know, basically who's your ideal client? Who do you want to find you and how would they find you? So ideal clients pretty open. I mean, I, I kind of specialize more with early to late stage startups. You know, again, a lot of my clientele over the years has been in the US. So, you know, series A, the kind of later stage starts, primarily high growth technology companies. Um, I specialize, you know, really from a recruiting standpoint, probably more in the technical recruiting space. So like, you know, people that are experienced professionals up to C-suite executives. Um, I play CEO level on down and I've worked with CEO, lo CEO level on down. Um, but I'm starting, I, I'm realizing that I, I'd like to, especially as getting into Alberta, I mean, I've lived in Calgary for over a decade and I have never really like went out and met the clients here in Calgary. So uh, I think that would be really cool. Uh, obviously this is a big oil and gas and there's some other industries that I'm not as familiar with in terms of the space that I've really provided resources. But, you know, at the end of the day, we all need technology, no matter what the industry is. Um, I've done a lot of finance and stuff as well, marketing. So um, they could find me. I, I had a website that I created in, in 2015. In full transparency, I've never really leveraged it. I don't even, I think it's still floating around out there somewhere, but I certainly wouldn't want to, uh, I don't even know if I'd want people to visit it because it's probably just eight years old and nothing to it now. Um, but so my uh, email is jason at jmrush.com. That's M as in Melissa, jmrush.com. Um, they can find me on LinkedIn. I'm super active on there. I think LinkedIn is an amazing platform. Uh, not only for folks that are 
looking for work, folks that are looking to also find the people that are looking for work, but also just to get inspiration. Like I check my newsfeed multiple times a day and yeah, there's some doom and gloom on there and there's some layoffs and of course, and I'm, I'm not neglecting that, but there's also a lot of great inspirational stories on there. There's a lot of great resources on there. So um, LinkedIn is usually kind of my preferred method for folks to reach out to me. And then the, the email will probably be next. Sounds great. Thanks again. You've been awesome. I love the candid conversation uh, and the frankness. I think a lot of people are going to appreciate it and can relate to it. I think that's part of the hardest yeah. part. We have, I know the people I've met and even my own personal journey of growing my business, we have visions of grandeur. We think there's going to be a plan. Um, and then there's the reality of execution. And I think we need to understand that it, it all happens in a different way for different people. The, the principles of business never change, but how we experience them and how we put them in play will change based on the industry, who we are as people and receptiveness. So thanks again. Appreciate it, Jason, and look forward to talking to you in a couple of weeks. I certainly can. Thank you as well. Bye. See ya.